Welcome to Sunday Night Prime. And we're always happy to hear you and be one of us in our meeting. And this evening, we have a very, very pleasant and friendly and good visitor tonight. I want you to get to know our visitor tonight. He's an outstanding priest, Father Serafin Nikolenko. Father, uh, Father is a member of the Marians of the Immaculate Ver- Conversion, Conception. Immaculate Ver- Ma- Mary Immaculate. And also, he is very, very active and leading in the Divine Mercy devotion. And he can tell us a good deal about it. Many of our lost listeners are involved in Divine Mercy. And a number of our non-Catholic friends listen. Some of them have asked me about, what is this new influence on divine mercy? We believe the divine mercy for centuries, for millennia. Why suddenly divine mercy? So there is a fascinating story that comes out right before the Second World War. And I'd like to, first of all, since we're getting ready for the Divine Mercy Conference here in New York, which is going to be March 26th at Cardinal Spellman High School uh, in the Bronx, tell me, Father, tell our audience, what about Divine Mercy? During the uh, revelations through Sister Faustina Kowalska, a nun in Poland, uh, our Lord wants uh, the revival of something that he says already exists. One day, the sister, after she finished her initial work, went into the chapel and uh, to say a prayer to offer to the Lord all her prayers, mortifications, sufferings of that day, so that the Holy Father would approve the feast that he is asking for. But then she said, Lord, tell me one more thing. They tell me that such a feast already exists, so why should I talk about it? And the Lord retorted immediately, and who knows anything about it? Even those who should know about it and teach about it don't know about it. Therefore, I want the image Uh, venerated uh, on that day uh, so that everyone would come to know my mercy. And this, of course, was after he had revealed himself in a vision to Sister Faustina uh, with his hand lifted up in blessing and the other moving aside his robe from which two great rays come forth, one red and the other pale, as he explained later, symbolizing the blood and water that flowed from his side when his heart was pierced on the cross after his death. Well, now, we have a a number of people watching here our program. First of all, we have Catholics and Orthodox Catholics, Orthodox, and Divine Mercy fits in very beautifully for both of our churches, but also the idea of private revelation. A person receives a visit, a vision from a divine person, from Christ, from Mary. This is not familiar with Protestants. However, most Protestants do know about Our Lady of Lourdes, how the little peasant girl Bernadette saw the Virgin Mary standing in the grotto. And many have heard Our Lady of Fatima, three little children, uh, humble peasant children, saw the Virgin Mary. And they didn't know who he was, who she was. In fact, Bernadette didn't know who she was talking to either. Here we have a sister, a nun, and it was in the 1930s. Yes. Uh, She was a, a very humble devout, humble sister, kind of a peasant girl herself. What happened? Well, the Lord prepared her, even from her tender age, 
she was quite familiar with the Lord. She even said at five that uh, she had a dream where she was walking in paradise with the Blessed Mother among beautiful flowers. <clears throat> so they didn't make much of it, and maybe just the dreams of a little girl. But uh, when she was seven already, as she writes in her diary, at a, a service in church during the exposition of the Most Blessed Sacrament, she gave her heart to the Lord and made a little room there that whenever she could not come to the church, she could converse with him there. So she had experiences, and there was, she was about 14 when she couldn't go to school anymore because uh, the schools just opened after the First World War broke out. <clears throat> and uh, the older children had to leave because there wasn't enough room for the others. Uh, she was allowed to go to help a family as a housemaid. And uh, there she also had revelations uh, where one day she yelled out, fire, fire, because she worked for someone who owned the bakery. Everybody ran out to see the fire, and there was none. And so they called her sister to see if she's getting sick or something. And she says, no, I'm not going mad. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this place. I must enter a convent. And so when she went back home and asked her parents for permission to enter, uh, they had the excuse. They didn't have enough money for a dowry, which was uh, an amount of money that was kept just in case the candidate to the community would not uh, stay and she would have something to leave with to start a new life. And she says, oh, no, he told me that he's going to take care of me. And she just understood it was Jesus who told her that he wanted her to go to the convent because he was preparing these things or her for these things. And she didn't know what lay ahead until um, one day when she was at a dance with her sister uh, the Lord appeared to her all bleeding and he said, how long am I going to wait for you? Uh, how long are you going to be putting me off? And so she took off and uh, stopped at the nearest church. It was a cathedral in the city of Wuj on her way home to where she worked. And she just prostrated in front of the Blessed Sacrament and says, Lord, what would you have me do? And he just told her, go to Warsaw, there you'll enter a convent. And immediately she got up, went to the house to settle uh, things. She had to tell the lady precisely on that day whether she was going to stay on or leave. And uh, she asked her uncle who lived there to bring some of the stuff for her parents and to say goodbye to them. And, uh, so, and she brought him a little bit of whiskey and cookies. Whiskey. <laughs> whiskey. And she <laughs> says, I just got you a little so you don't get drunk. Now take me to the train station. And that's, she left that night. Uh, and uh, the next morning, she found the closest church. And while the masses were being said, the voice told her to go to the priest who, that was celib who just celebrated a particular mass and that he will help you. And he directed her to a place where she stayed for a whole year before she was able to enter a convent. And so the Lord prepared her uh, mystically. She went through a purification period. It's called the Dark Nights. And uh, her, the sister in charge of her said, you came out of this quick because you were obedient. And uh, then she felt like a totally new person and uh, totally a new uh, person. reborn person, so to speak. And uh, she then listened to the Lord's uh, implications or his invitations to what he was asking. So he asked, first of all, that she paint an image of him as, she, as he appeared to her with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. And then later on, he gave her the task of uh, getting a feast established in the church in honor of the divine mercy. Now, that didn't have to do with the attribute of God, but Jesus as the divine mercy incarnate. And so it was supposed to be his feast. And he, uh, the day he chose for it, is the uh, octave day of Easter, the Sunday after Easter. And uh, I always wondered why he chose that particular day. And I spent many years researching what could be the purpose of it. And um, I got the best clue from a book, The Bible and the Liturgy, by Father Jean Danielou, who was later declared a cardinal. And he, he uh, uh, offered about three chapters 
uh, on that theme of the octave. And evidently, the, uh, the true meaning of the octave was not alive in the church. In fact, after Vatican II, they got rid of all of them except two, Easter and Christmas. And uh, what we learned from Father Daniel Lu is that uh, uh, in the Eastern Church, particularly from Gregory of Nazianzen, he gave a special sermon on that day one year. And all the uh, students of the fathers um, are surprised that he said that Easter Sunday is a wonderful day, but the Sunday after Easter is more wonderful. And the reason he says it points to the other life. He says, Easter is the boundary between death and life. But the octave day of Easter points Easter. to the future life. Oh. And that is the purpose. And so I found a thing in St. Thomas Aquinas where he, after Aristotle, he says, everything that exists has two perfections. The first one is that the thing is and what it is in its integrity. But the second perfection is what is that thing existing for? Like a plan of a house for the house to be built, an instrument for the music to be played. And certainly the purpose for it is greater than the instrument or the thing itself, but it could not exist without it. So too, the future life could not be without the resurrection. And therefore, he considers it more wonderful. Well, the divine mercy itself then is bent, woven in to the whole revelation of Christ. Oh, not only yes. that. Death, from from Genesis to Revelation, revelation. Yes. the mercy of God is there continuously. Now, we celebrate the mercy of God in every Mass. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison. And we have beautiful titles. Our Lady, Lady of Mercy, Mother of Mercy, uh, Mater Misericordiae. Misericordia is grace in, in Latin. And since the middle or the beginning, uh, really, of the 20th century, particularly after the 30s, there's been an increased, constant interest in the divine mercy. In my own mind, I'd like to hear you this on this, Father, that St. Faustina was this young, devout, pious girl who was a sister, seeing these visions. What was happening in Germany? Well, the persecution of the Jewish people. And it's interesting that the last family that Faustina worked for was Jewish. And uh, <clears throat> they had many Jewish friends visiting <clears throat> that house while she was working there. And uh, one of them became a Franciscan nun who worked with the blind in Warsaw. And she was Jewish? Yes. But uh, thanks evidently to Faustina's prayers or whatever, she became a Catholic later on. And uh, one day after the war, she was riding in a tram in Warsaw, <clears throat> and she met the lady at whose house she used to be a guest. And she says, did you always have just that one uh, young girl working for you? And she says, no, I had a whole bottle of them, but she was the best one, and we were so sorry that after a year she went to the convent, and everybody was in mourning in the house <clears throat> that, that she left. And she says, well, what was her name? And she says, Helena Kowalska. And the nun just jumped. She says, are you sure? She says, yeah. She says, let's get off. And uh, she says, what's the matter? And the sister answered, all over the churches is a placard. Anybody who knew Sister Faustina uh, should come and give deposition of what they know about her because her cause is up for beatification. Isn't that a wonderful story? And, uh, so she said what a tremendous influence just by her working in that home. Uh, she had upon the whole village. And uh, one of the major things there, she had a great 
a devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And while she was working, she used to sing the special hymn in honor of the Blessed Sacrament so that the whole family knew it by heart. And they were Jewish. And they were Jewish. They were Jewish. Uh, well, the gentleman asked the father to uh, baptize them all, but uh, he was spared the Holocaust, thank God. Well, Father, we'll be back in just a break, but we're moving into a very dramatic story here <laughs> with the Nazis in the background. We'll be back in two minutes. father talking about here we those terrible days of the 1930s now you and i are old enough that as youngsters we heard about hitler at least i'm old enough that i would remember i coming into the house one day and this man was talking on the radio with a high falsetto voice in german i didn't know what language it was and I said to my father, who is this strange sound? He says, it's a man named Hitler. And that was 1938. And the world was cast into hell. And uh, that's right at the time of St. Faustina's death, right, at the, right before Hitler invaded Poland. September the 1st. September the 1st, 1939. And... The Nazis, Hitler said, Slaven Slaven, the Slavs are slaves. And he treated all the, uh, the Polish people and the Slavic people terribly and extremely terribly cruel to the Jews. And especially the very large community of Jewish people that lived in Poland. When I was growing up as a boy, there were many P Polish Jews and German Jews in New York at that time who had come, fled from before Hitler. So it was a terrible time, a time of cruelty and a time of mercy. Actually, uh, the Nazis imprisoned thousands of Catholic priests. Sure. Many of them died in the camps. Sure. Now, they wanted to eradicate anybody who would promote history or the faith. Uh, and one of our priests, who was a foremost poet at the time, uh, managed to escape from Warsaw uh, towards Vilnius, which was then still within Poland. And uh, it was at that time that he met Sister Faustina's confessor, who found out that he had intentions to go to the United States and so he came to him with a treatise uh, that he would want the priest to take to the United States uh, to have bishops there and uh, Catholic universities appeal to Rome to institute that feast of the Divine Mercy. Divine Mercy. And so the father says, well, I don't accept devotions that were not approved by the church. And here Faustino was just dead two years. And um, he said, when you get to your confreres, please present these. And through marvelous events, the father found himself in Moscow where there was money waiting for him that the father sent from Washington. Then he passed by rail all through Siberia um, to Vladivostok. And it was a Jewish lawyer who pounded the doors of the Japanese consulate to get him a visa to get him to Japan uh, because the offices were already closed. But he persisted until they hoped and they gave it to him. And that's how he was able to go to Japan he still was able to give a retreat to the Franciscans who were in that monastery in Nagasaki ah. that was built uh, by the uh, Mesimilian Kolbe uh, over the other side of the hill that survived. And from there, he came to Seattle by boat before Pearl Harbor in May. And as soon as he reached the conference, he told them the whole story that he learned from the confessor. And About St. Faustina. Yes. She wasn't a saint, of course. No. 
And the next year, they had an imprimatur from the Archbishop of Baltimore, Washington, and that's when we started, hardly two and a half years after Faustina died, to spread the message. And I know I heard in Buffalo that way up in the 1940s, in a Polish church, there was the Divine Mercy image painted on the wall. Well, my hometown parish <clears throat> uh, was the first in the Western Hemisphere to publicly have an image of Divine Mercy uh, uh, enthroned in the church. Where was that from? This was Adams, Massachusetts. Adams, Massachusetts. Again in a church in honor of St. Stanislaus Koska, uh -huh. where Faustina went to the cathedral under that title, uh -huh. where the Lord told her to go to Warsaw. And it's interesting, mixed into this are the Jews, you know, who were treated so horribly in, in Poland. Well, uh, I got to meet a, a rabbi <clears throat> who was a uh, survivor of Auschwitz in Connecticut. And I told him, I'm looking up for information on the octave. What can you tell me about that in the Jewish tradition? And he wrote out the word, Shimon, I believe it is, as number eight. But it has the root of the word for oil, and that's where the Greek is eleison from, which is oh, ever since. So there is a connection. Isn't that fascinating? Yes. Well, uh, it's wonderful now that we learn of the Divine Mercy, Divine Mercy Sunday, and we have a Divine Mercy Pope. Tell them about our... Do, we, do you know we have a Divine Mercy Pope? I think we have two Divine Mercy Popes because the present Holy Father says he accepts the magisterium and the legacy left to him by his venerable predecessor. Uh -huh. And he, uh, uh, he made a statement that um, it was in 2006 uh, during a, on, on the Feast of the Divine Mercy where he said the, he used the word cult, but it means the worship of divine mercy is not a second-rate devotion, but an integral dimension of a Christian's life and prayer. And so uh, he totally accepts uh, what the Holy Father handed down to the church. He calls it his magisterium and the, the main point of his pontificate. And of course... And he always Paul brings up the fact that, and the Lord arranged that on the vigil of that feast, uh, that he should have died but the people up in Japan, Philippine Islands, uh, New Zealand say it was already Mercy Sunday when uh -huh. he passed away. <laughs> this is Pope John Paul II, right. died on Divine Mercy Sunday. How much comes together on this? How beautifully it, it comes. And you know uh, how much the word Divine Mercy could bring the world together, that idea. Well, People of, did not, have nothing to do with Christianity or the West. The Buddhist people, Hindu people, they would understand divine mercy. The God is merciful to us. St. Thomas Aquinas said, the word misericordia is the heart going out to misery. That's what it means. Then he says, the greatest misery is not to be. Therefore, when the Holy Trinity, which is love itself, wanted someone upon whom to pour out all its goodness, it decided to create. And so creation is the first act of divine, divine mercy. mercy. But then, when the crown of creation fell, the second, even greater uh, act of mercy is redemption. Yes. And then there's going to be a third stage and that is when God unites all his people to himself in the eternal life. Uh, no one deserves that. No one can even expect it. And that is the highest form of mercy that is, going, uh, that is open to humanity that will respond in trust to the Lord. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a difficult theological or spiritual principle to appreciate. But as John Paul II wrote in his second encyclical, this great encyclical on the divine mercy, he points out that people are reluctant to even speak the word. For Why? others, it's a weakness. 
Yeah. And yet, it is the greater strength. Uh, even Shakespeare saw that, where at the end of Portia's speech in The Merchant of Venice, he was, and earthly monarchs are, un, are like unto God when mercy seasons justice. And uh, so he had the real theology uh, in, in that play. In Hamlet, too, when uh, mercy comes down uh, like... Uh, no, that's, that's from the Merchant of oh, Venice. Oh, that of Venice. Yes. The quality of mercy, mercy is, is not, not strange. That's right. All is the gentle rain from heaven upon the place. Be, and it is twice blessed. Him who gives and who takes. Now, uh, I would think interesting, you know, through uh, television, radio, the other religions of the world, of the, of the East, you know, the huge numbers of Buddhists and Hindu, Zoroastrians, you know, they're, they're, they hear about Christianity. Often the Christians haven't behaved very nicely by any means. Or when they think of Europe, they think of Christianity. It had nothing to do with Christianity. People like Hitler and Stalin and all, nothing to do with Christianity. But to the people of the East, it's all one big thing. But when they hear mercy, uh, how beauty. And of course, you and I grew up with that very beautiful prayer written by the monk who was crippled. He was born with a severe uh, deformity, and he was blind. Her Herman of Reichenau. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. He wrote that beautiful hymn, the Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae. That was, we, we don't know the background of that beautiful, beautiful prayer. But actually, the prayer, Subtum Presidium, yes. the, or, the original Greek of that prayer <clears throat> is translated, we, uh, we hasten to your mercy, That's right. most holy mother. And that is the oldest prayer to extent, Mary. Yeah, yes. The oldest extant yes, prayer to Mary. Mary. Subtum Presidium. Under thy tender mercy. Under thy turning mercy. We have requested tender mercy. And uh, now, when I think uh, many of the people who w watch our program are not Catholic, uh, many are Protestant, many are Orthodox, many are Jewish. Be surprised how many Jewish people say, what are you watching our program for? I say, you're Jewish. This is nothing worthwhile except this. You know, uh, that's what they'll say about EWTN. And uh, how is it that it brings us together? There's an interesting thing that I found <clears throat> in my research about the octave. I found this book celebrating Jewish holidays. And um, they spoke about different groups of Jews um, celebrating Hanukkah in, in different ways. And uh, in a... Uh, a special note, one of the <clears throat> contributors pointed out <clears throat> that uh, what the Jewish writings point out is that various rituals disappear when they don't have an impact, an, a, a contemporary impact. Um, but he says the Jews had the uh, proper sense to keep those rituals on the books because one day they probably would be relevant and people would revive them again. So I think this is what happened, because Sister Faustina um, prophesied that that work that the Lord gave her and her confessor would one day be as though totally undone, but that then there, it would come back in a great, as a great splendor in the church, even though it was uh, dormant for a long time. Yes. So it must be that there was such a feast, and the Lord says there is such a feast, and he wants it revived because of his implications of preparing the world for his coming and for his gathering of his people to himself. Well, we have beautiful messages on divine mercy, and I'm very grateful to you, Father, for bringing them to us, and uh, we'll be back. <laughs> Now, 
now back to our subject, Father, uh, and we're talking about the Divine Mercy conferences. Many of you will be aware that there have been conferences. And it was one in Rome, uh, and uh, that was, a, I attended that. That was very beautiful with the Archbishop of Vienna. Uh, where have been several in this country? Where are they now? Well, the one, the major one in our uh, in the states was last year in Washington D.C. Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, but they're going on even in Asia and Oceania. And we have right America. up on our uh, the television, we have the pictures about our new one that's coming March twenty six, very shortly, and we didn't like. The, to invite you to come to that one if you're in the metropolitan area. Uh, where uh, Do you go to all the conferences? I try to get as, as many as I'm invited to. <clears throat> I just came back from a circuit of conferences in Minnesota, California, and uh, Florida. Uh-huh. And um, uh, in San Diego, <clears throat> uh, there were only about 365 people who registered for the conference there. But on the day, 800 came. Uh-huh. And almost all of these places that have, some have been having conferences for 10 and 15 years, uh, more and more people are coming now. Yes. So there must be something that the people feel uh, attracted by the message of mercy, that they want to go deeper into the matter. Uh, the, uh, the one is coming up now, March 26th, very shortly, at Cardinal Spellman High School in the Bronx. Uh, You're going to be there, of course. And uh, Father Bernard was one of the priors of our community, and I will be talking. And also Father Pavone, uh, Monsignor Lasanti, Father Roche, who is a confrere of yours, and Lila Rose. Uh, Do you know Lila? No, I don't think I've got her. She's been a very interesting speaker on divine mercy. Very, very interesting. So you'll be there, and uh, Bishop Holly, Bishop Martin Holly, Auxiliary Bishop uh, of Washington, he'll be saying the Mass, and our own Bishop Walsh, here right at where we're uh, broadcasting from the place where Bishop Walsh is the director here of the seminary, Bishop Gerald Walsh. So, if you're in the New York York metropolitan area, come on out on March 26th. And if you're not in New York, you can travel. (laughs) Now, Father, uh, you've been doing this how many years? Since I entered the community of the Marians, which was in 1947. 1947. Isn't that marvelous? In 1947, I graduated from grammar school, so you're a little bit older than I am. And uh, and you were bringing the message every place. Well, it was stopped for 20 years, you know, just as Faustina predicted it would. Uh, There were some misgivings about things that were quoted that were quoted that she has said, which were not true, but there was no published diary at the time. And it was difficult to get any information from Poland because the communists were very strict about documents going back and forth with Rome. I see. And so um, the, uh, uh, it, it took 20 years before the second part of her prophecy came true that it would become a new splendor in the church. And now, that, of course, came with the... Uh, introduction of the image of divine mercy and then the Holy Father establishing the Feast of Mercy. This is Pope John Paul. The second. In many ways is the Pope of divine mercy. Yes, definitely. And I think when he was in Poland, when he was in Krakow, that's when he became very aware of the divine mercy because it was in his diocese, right? Well, while he, uh, under the Nazi occupation, as a young man, he worked in a quarry uh, for some uh, chemical company. And that's where he was preparing in a clandestine seminary for the uh, priesthood. 
and uh, when in uh, 2002 he dedicated the Basilica of the Divine Mercy close to Sister Faustina's tomb, after Holy Communion he mused and he said, who would have thought that this young man in wooden shoes, he said, that's all we could wear during the war, uh, after work would come to the chapel there to pray where the sisters were, uh, would one day dedicate this basilica on the hill. Isn't that beautiful? And on the hill overlooking the quarry uh, was the cemetery where Sister Faustina was buried. And now that quarry is going to become a center called Do Not Be Afraid in honor of Pope John Paul II. And there will be like a library, chapel, uh, and conference rooms um, in his honor. I had the pl pl pr privilege of offering Mass there in the chapel of the Divine Mercy, but I don't remember seeing the quarry. Uh, it was down the hill from the monastery. Down the hill. Yes. And uh, when you go to some place like that, and I remember there, this is special presence. I went to, in Paris, to Rue de Bac, the chapel of the Miraculous Medal of St. Catherine Labore. And I was there with someone and I said, Catherine Labore is in this chapel, I can tell. And when I got to St. Faustina's, I had the same experience. That presence is there. Have you ever experienced that? Yes, it's the same as when you get to the, the grotto at Lourdes. That's right, <laughs> of course, of course, my good, my good friend Bernadette. And uh, it's interesting, I went to the body of Bernadette is in Nevers, where she died as a young sister. And her body is there, very impressive, you know. Incorrupt, totally incorrupt. Incorrupt, incorrupt in the chapel. And you're obviously, Bernadette's site is there. But I experience her presence at Lourdes. Uh, Lourdes is a marvelous place. I, I love Lourdes. Uh, and the, the, the statue of Our Lady, for those who believe no explanation is necessary, and those who don't believe no explanation is possible. That's right on the statue there. Well, Father, let's get back to the Divine Mercy now. In this country now, the, the devotion has been growing. Sad to say, I remember people 15 or 20 years ago were opposed to the devotion. It, it, you know, this, it's incomprehensible, I said to me. How could you be against the divine mercy? What are you, in favor of divine justice? Would you like to have a shrine to divine justice? Well, the Lord says, if you refuse to pass through the gate of mercy, you will have to pass through the gate of justice. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and you know, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, some of the member of the clergy, actually, were complaining about it. We got too much going on already, too many things, too many, you know, we got no Venus to Our Lady and no Venus to the Sacred Heart, no Venus to this, that, 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 that. I don't want anything else. See. And, uh, well, there are know. tremendous promises with the novena of chaplets before the Feast of Mercy. The Lord says even unimaginable graces will be uh, bestowed uh, through that prayer, and particularly for the sick, the dying. For the sick and the dying. And what, what a beautiful prayer that is to be praying for the dying. We're all going to be dying, the whole kit and caboodle of us. Everybody. And when you have friends or dear ones or relatives, old or young, sometimes very young, what more beautiful thing you well, can Well, one pray. of the uh, uh, objections is <clears throat> that you're praying for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us. But this, it's Easter week. How can you bring that up again? And actually, my rebuttal is that at the height of the Easter celebration and Easter night in the Eastern churches, particularly the Greek and the Russian, there is a special hymn sung three times, and it intertwines the cross and the resurrection yes. continuously within the hymn. 
The resurrection means meaningless without and, the crucifixion. And this is why uh, Pope John Paul II uh, calls um, the Paschal mystery the Easter gift. But the Paschal mystery includes the passion, death, and the resurrection. And uh, what would, you, you know, uh, the gospel without the cross is silly. It's, uh, you know, a pious thought. But uh, Well, the reason there is, <clears throat> I, I tell people, we have this connection with God as a piece of coal has with a diamond. There's some kind of a carbon there with, uh, with those minerals. But the piece of coal can become a sparkling diamond if it undergoes intense heat and pressure. And that was what the passion was for the humanity of Jesus. So that when he went through the passion and the death and even tasted rejection and, and damnation, because he did it out of love, as Father Cardinal Van Wa tells us, for the Father's intention to save sinners and for his love for sinners not to be lost, um, the, uh, uh, his love changed that damnation into salvation. And so it's, it's, uh, uh, the Paschal mystery is passing from death to life. An aspect of this, Father, I'm, I'm going to hear you talk about this, and I offered, uh, uh, our, our group are listening to us today. Uh, when you're dealing with someone who has been way off the line, they've been away from the church, away from God, maybe leading a very sinful life, along with not only not religion, but not morality. Somebody who has led a very bad life. And you're a priest, particularly an, a person getting older or having a serious illness. They want to talk. Suddenly. They never talked to a, a priest in 25 years. And they want to talk. What do you talk about? Well, they bring up their problem. <laughs> yes, yes. The solution is that the Lord gives us through these revelations. Of? <laughs> of mercy. divine mercy, yes. And you know? Well, in fact, he, he said that for some, if even the greatest sinner would recite the chaplet of divine mercy once, he would receive grace from his mercy. And we have many accounts that the Lord keeps to his promise. Uh, and he calls that the last plank of salvation. Actually, it's like a sheet anchor, the last big anchor that's thrown in to, to stabilize the ship in, in times of danger. And that's what, the name he gave it. Uh, so, and he keeps his promises because the people who take him up on it know the effects. Well, the fact is the disciples and apostles of Divine Mercy have been giving out a hundred million papers with a Divine Mercy chaplet on it, how to say it, all over the place. I have a box of them in my room. <laughs> I must have 500 that they gave them to me. When, when you get near an Apostle of Mercy, you better watch out. <laughs> you <true>. better duck. <laughs> and uh, anybody could be able to get hold of it. And you know, it's totally appropriate for a Protestant. You know, oh, yeah. uh, I've discovered this when we're picketing an abortion place. And uh, the Catholics are out there saying the rosary. And uh, Protestant people say, well, do we, do we, are we supposed to be saying the rosary? I said, well, let's say the divine mercy. And you joined in. And they joined right in. They love it. It's very scriptural. Very mm -hmm. scriptural. Mm -hmm. And it's purely Christian. It's about Christ. And I was down someplace preaching, and there were down there or someplace in the south, some city down there, and we went over to the abortion wedding already, and maybe just a few Catholics, because very few Catholics live there, very devout Protestant people on Sunday, Saturday afternoon, out praying, and the Catholics are saying the rosary, and nobody else saying anything. Yeah, we, I told them I gave them cards, 
but let's say this. And we all said it together, and, and it was beautiful. Uh, I, I wish that it was more and more known to Protestant people. Well, actually, a great benefactor helped us to put the message of mercy on iPods, and you can get the apps, which has the chaplets there, how to say it, uh, etc., and all the other information can be copied off uh, the iPod as a result. I see. Under the divine mercy. I'm sorry to say the friars don't even have television. So I, I've heard this about iPods. Because you know, that now they have preparation for confession on them. Yeah, I heard that, <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I first heard about iPods, they, it was something you could eat. I thought <laughs> you could eat the thing. So, uh, but they, they tell me uh, all this iPods and all this is going on. I, I just, I know how to play a phonograph. That's about all. Uh, now, the world is moving in to a strange time. There is apparently world peace, except for a few places, Libya, a few places where there, uh, some places in Africa, there are serious uh, things. But for the most part, the world at this moment it is peaceful. And people convinced that it's going to go on. That was the dream of the United Nations, that there would be world peace. And God knows we would all be very grateful that there was world well, peace. Our Lord told Sister Faustina twice, <clears throat> mankind will have no peace so long as it does not turn with trust in my mercy. And the word that was translated in English, peace, actually in the Polish would mean security. And that's what people are looking for, yes. nonetheless, that there is a great lack of security among people now. Yes. And so the Lord promises, but we need to trust him. We have to take his word for it and act upon it. Uh, we mean so much... Uh, uh, you know, I was a little boy, and I went to my grandmother's house on a Sunday afternoon. And we walked up, she lived on the second floor, in Bayonne. And the house was absolutely silent. Several cousins in it. And I heard a voice on the teleradio. And I have asked the Congress to pass a, a, a declaration of war with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it was the beginning of the Second World War, which was already raging in Europe. And what a terrible time we lived through. And when did the war come to an end? About 25 years later with the Cold War. Now there is relatively peace in the world. But I think it would be foolish to assume that we're going to be living through long times of peacefulness. I wish it were true. I'd be very grateful to God. But the day may come that we really need prayer for peace again. We have to trust the Lord for it. Remember... Years ago, when we were young fellows, at the end of Mass, at the end of Mass, there was always the prayer for peace. The Hail Holy Queen, the three Hail Marys, it was for peace and for the conversion of Russia. Remember that mm -hmm. way back. Now you go to Russia, there's much more religion all over the place, and the Orthodox and the Catholics and Protestants and the Jews and the Muslims are there. But what will happen in the future? And, and this is when we must train and work divine mercy. Father, thank you so very much. O oh Lord, bless each one of us watching and listening to our program today. And please bless Father Seraphim 
and all who work for divine mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we ask you to please send in your envelopes to EWTN to keep our program going and our network going. It's a big job, and I know you have been faithful and generous in these difficult times financially, but I must say that people are being faithful to EWTN, and please keep it going because it is a work of God. God bless. Amen.